Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first Demystifying the Department of Justice virtual presentation. My name is Maheen Ahmed. I am the Deputy Director for the Office of Community Awareness, Response and Engagement, also known as CARE. I will be your moderator for this next hour that we will be spending together. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to share a little bit about CARE. Our office was launched by AG Rob Bonta in July of last year, 2021. And our goals are to build relationships with California's communities, focusing specifically on those who have been historically marginalized and underrepresented. We also work to directly meet the needs of California's communities and ensure that DOJ's policies and programs are directly informed by those needs. And lastly, our goal is to develop knowledge and awareness among the public of Department of Justice's mission and actions on behalf of the people of California. And that last goal is one of the reasons why we've launched the series, Demystifying the DOJ, to do just that. Through these quarterly presentations, we're hoping to develop knowledge and awareness of everything the Department of Justice has to offer, including uh, the resources and programs that we have in our various divisions, our sections, bureaus, offices. And today marks the first presentation of our series. We are excited to be spotlighting our very own Victim Services Unit during this National uh, Victims of Crime Week. I'll share a little bit just to start off um, about what Victim Services Unit does, and then I will hand it off to our victim advocates who will be uh, presenting for about half an hour on what the unit does. They will be sharing a PowerPoint presentation. After that, we will be having Q&A. Uh, thank you to those of you who sent in your questions in advance in the registration process that those have been shared with the advocates. And we'll get to a couple of those if we have more time. There is a Q&A box uh, you might be able to see on your screen where you can drop in questions throughout the presentation if something pops up and we hope to be able to get to it at the end. And then before we close off, we have a quick poll to understand if you have any feedback for us on not only how this presentation will go, but also to determine what our next um, presentation topics will be. So we'll, we'll give you about four questions um, and we really hope that you can stay until the end to answer those. So um, I'll begin with just sharing a little bit about Victim Services Unit before handing it over. So the VSU Victim Services Unit, it was created in 1999 to better serve crime victims and their families. They support um, victims and their families in every stage of the criminal process. They accomplish this by advocating for victims, identifying and closing any gaps in services that are available to them. And at the end of the day, they try to work to provide client-centered, trauma-informed, and culturally sensitive services to all crime victims, including underserved, at-risk, underrepresented, and vulnerable populations. So with that, I will be handing it over to our two speakers for today, uh, Rose Robinson and Vanessa Ruiz. They are victim advocates within the Victim Services Unit, and uh, we hope that this is an informative presentation for you. So with that, uh, Rose, please take it away. Thank you, Maheen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Like uh, Maheen said, my name is Rose Robinson. I am a victim advocate here with the Office of the Attorney General Victim Services Unit at the California Department of Justice. And we are going to give you all a brief overview of the services that our office provides. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Vanessa Reese. I'm one of the victim advocates here at the California Department of Justice Victim Services Unit. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen to today's series, focusing on the work we do here at the Office of the Attorney General. Um, as Mahim has mentioned, this is National Crime Victims Rights Week. And as such, this year's theme focuses on survivor rights, access to services, and the equity for all su survivors. So this is a perfect segue um, to talk about victim services and what we do here. We're hoping that you're able to walk away, at least for today, with some knowledge of survivor rights and the services that are available within our office. 
And then we also wanted to start off by providing you with a visual here uh, where we are located within the California Department of Justice and the subject matter we will be discussing at today's series. We're part of the Office of Community Awareness, Response and Engagement and Victim Services is where we are located, listed in this organizational chart highlighted in yellow. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here is our Victim Services Unit team. Um, our VSU manager is Johanna Milan. Um, we do have four victim advocates. We are located in downtown Sacramento, and we do cover all 58 counties. So I'll just reintroduce myself, Rose Robinson. I've been a victim advocate here at the State of California Department of Justice Victim Services Unit um, since July of 2021. I've been in the victim services field for a little over seven years. And prior to my work here at the state level, I was a victim advocate at the San Francisco District Attorney's Office Victim Services Division. We next have our other advocate, Ashley Rojas, who is also a victim advocate. She came on board August of 2021, and she came from the Santa Clara District Attorney's Office Victim Services Unit, and she has also been in the victim services field for a little over seven years as well. Next, we have Renee Adame, who has been at Victim Services here at DOJ for a little over 14 years. So our, our team lead, our kind of head honcho here. Um, so she worked prior to the state here at Victim Services. She was at the Victim Compensation Program before the merge with CDCR, and she also provided services to victims of crime. Lastly, I have my colleague and my co-presenter, Vanessa Ruiz, who is also a victim advocate here at DOJ Victim Services. He has been here at the state for a little over two years, two and a half years, and she has been doing the work of victim advocacy for a little over nine years. And prior to her work here at the state level, she did come from the San Joaquin County District Attorney's Office. Here's our team. Like I mentioned, we are located here in downtown Sacramento, but because we are state level advocates, we do cover all 58 counties of the state of California. Next slide, please. Oh, you're on mute, Vanessa. <laughs> I'm going to be able to provide a little bit of a snapshot as to what we do. So some of the levels of prosecuting agencies is something that we want to paint a picture of because government can get a little bit complex in where, where we're located. Some victim advocates um, carry a wide range of responsibility and some instances have different work titles. Some are employed in nonprofits and others in government agencies. With respect to our office and in government, we are state victim advocates. But first, as mentioned before, we want to describe the different layers of government to where victim advocates may be housed in to assist survivors of violent crimes. We start off with the local city or city attorney's office. Usually they tend to handle the misdemeanor cases at that level um, and usually tend to be located in larger counties such as Los Angeles, San Francisco, to name a few. Then we go and move on to the county level or the local county district attorney's office, which has about, which houses victim advocates to provide services to uh, survivors of violent crimes. Um, in each uh, 58 counties in the state of California. Then we move on to the state of California Department of Justice, Office of the Attorney General, and that's where we are located at the State Department. Then we move forward to the Federal Department, which houses at, uh, victim advocates at the United States Department of Justice, Office of the Attorney General, and then it branches off also with the Federal Bureau of Investigations, where, where they house victim specialists. So at every layer of government, um, they're either in nonprofit, in probation departments, or at the state or federal level, victim advocates are housed to provide services to survivors. Next slide, please. Thank you, Vanessa. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the victim services unit responsibility. So we do provide advocacy and assistance. So we do provide victim services in criminal court cases that our office is prosecuting. So um, the, um, that'll be our deputy attorney generals who are our prosecutors here at the state level. They are going to be the ones prosecuting that case. And we do provide those victim services to those victims. 
We also do respond to inquiries regarding capital and non-capital um, appeals, including the appeals that our office is handling. We also have access to the sexual assault forensic tracking notification system that is called SAFETY, and um, we will get to that a little bit more um, throughout our presentation towards the end. We also provide resources and publications um, to victims, um, victims next of kin, um, community agencies, as well as the public. Um, we also do respond to crime victim inquiries on our um, victim services statewide 800 phone line as well as our VSU email system. So when it comes to our 800 line, we do handle three voicemail boxes. The first voicemail box is for inquiries regarding criminal appeals, criminal court case appeals. The second email, the second voicemail box, we also handle inquiries regarding sexual assault forensic um, evidence tracking kits. And then the, lastly, the last email voicemail box that we do handle is for any and all inquiries um, regarding anything that victims may have questions about. And lastly, I do want to mention that our office um, is involved in investigating officer-involved shootings. We'll get to that a little bit later on in our presentation as well. Next slide, please. We want, I'll also always want to take the time to commemorate those who have lost their lives to violent crimes, their next of kin, and those who have been survivors of crimes. Our existence here as victim service providers, excuse me, would have not been possible in part without survivors. Many of you have heard Miranda Wrights mentioned on TV crime shows, docuseries, and even the news. However, very few people know that victims also have rights in many states, including the state of California, um, which is known as Marcy's Rights. So Marcy's Law was named after a UC Santa Barbara college student, Marcy Nicholas. Marcy was stalked and killed by her ex-boyfriend in 1983, a time when basic victim rights did not exist. So therefore, a lot of our basis and a lot of what we do here at the um, Office of the Attorney General Victim Services Unit is that we focus on making sure that each survivor that comes to our office is being provided with these basic rights. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as Vanessa mentioned, there are 17 enumerated rights for crime victims that are provided by Marcy's Law here in the California Constitution. So these rights are do include, but they are not limited to, the right to be treated with fairness and respect, um, the right to be um, involved with the prosecuting agency, the right to be heard at certain proceedings, um, and to ensure that these rights are protected, victims need to be notified um, when important events in these particular cases or investigations are to occur, so they can have that opportunity to um, attend a court hearing, give a statement, or even to discuss what their feelings are, what they want to see happen in the case with the prosecuting agency. And so how a victim may be notified of these events depends on a specific case or the specific stage um, of the justice process, where the offender is, whether or not they're in custody or not. So every law enforcement agency um, is obligated to provide the victims that, th that they come in contact with with their Marcy's card. And you can find that information not only on our website at the Office of the Attorney General, but you can also find that information at McGeorge School of Law and also the National Crime Center for Victims of Crime. They do a very, very good job of breaking down each victim's rights and how that victim can request for that right to be heard in court and um, with the law enforcement agency as well. Next slide, please. We also have uh, different types of cases that our office handles, um, one of them including conflict of interest. What that means is conflict of interest laws are grounded on the notion that government officials owe loyalty to the public. Therefore, government officials should not be allowed to enter the decision-making process. These types of cases are sent to our office for review by local district attorney offices. Once our office prosecutors determine that there are, a crime has occurred and it is in fact a conflict of interest, our office will continue with the prosecution and will, a case will move forward. Um, those tend to be, for example, staff member or a family member of a district attorney's office commits a crime or is a victim of a crime. Further examples include district attorney, a district attorney county victim advocate becomes a victim of domestic violence. 
Another example would include district attorney's son or daughter committing crimes or an investigator from the district attorney's office becoming a victim of stalking. We want to make sure that we're offering wraparound services in these types of incidents and we'll treat it like any any other case that comes to our office. Secondly, we have a direct filing of charges. Some of the common crime types that we see here at our office that include survivors or victims of crime include cyber exploitation, human and labor trafficking, sexual assault, mortgage fraud, financial crimes, elder abuse, and Medi-Cal fraud. In some of these instances, we have or we track or we provide case updates from ranging from one victim up to 2,000 victims. Some of them can be locally within the Sacramento area where we're located, or some can range to different counties, um, different states, and even across in different countries. So we always want to make sure that we are providing them with their rights, notifying them when our office has filed a complaint against a defendant, and then also providing them with additional resources and referrals. We understand that some of these crimes are very traumatic, um, and I know that it's probably easier said than done when we're providing these this information to them, but oftentimes when we're on the phone or even in person with some of these survivors, what tends to happen is there is a lot of emotion behind some of these crimes that were committed. It's a very stressful time. Some of them are very vulnerable. Um, so we are very careful of making sure that we are providing them, again, with wraparound services, emotional support, crisis intervention, in person or over the phone, before we can actually answer any of their questions in regards to the criminal justice. Next slide. Thank you, Vanessa. So like, he, like she said, we do provide assistance in those criminal court cases. It is important to note that, it, yes, while we're at the state level, we do operate in the same capacity as county level victim advocates to provide all similar services. Um, so we do provide orientation to the criminal justice process. It's very important that when we do provide that, that kind of support, that we are trauma-informed, that we are culturally sensitive, that we are client-centered, because these the criminal justice process, as we all know, can be very intimidating, very scary, and when you're, a victim is going through trauma or has experienced such a traumatic event, it can be very hard for them to kind of navigate this process by themselves. So us as victim advocates, whether it's a local level, or at the state level, or at the federal level, it's important for us to provide that that support to them. So just kind of breaking down simple terms to them, like what does it mean for a defendant to be arraigned? What does it mean to go to a preliminary hearing? What does it mean for a jury trial? Um, we also provide victim assistance and advocacy and accompaniment. So yes, we do cover 58 counties, but we do have the opportunity to go, whether it's a case in San Diego, San Diego or is it a case in Shasta County, we do travel and we do provide that support and accompaniment to those victims. Um, like I said, it's important for us to help them with the filling out applications for the California Victim Compensation Board, helping them with gathering documents for their restitution that they may want to submit, or even helping them write and speak at the sentencing with the victim impact statement. That is our opportunity to address the court and to kind of say how the case or how the crime has affected them in financially, spiritually, emotionally, physically and we are there to provide that support at every stage of the criminal justice process. And as Rose mentioned, you know, some, some of these cases uh, were coming in with, with individuals who, who also we get a mental image through the media. We, we think that some of uh, the criminal justice process is gonna happen within the hour and then that's not very realistic. Um, a lot of these cases take from several months to several years to even resolve in, in the criminal court. So if you can only imagine um, even being a survivor or victim of crime is just having to go through that extensive process, um, trying to deal with the trauma that just occurred to you and now trying to deal with the legal system and the criminal justice process. And so oftentimes it sounds very simple when we're describing, oh, we provide victim advocacy or we provide accompaniment or we just provide orientation to the criminal justice process. No, we break every single legal term to its basic, basic terminology. Um, oftentimes there means several people. Several people are trying to help and provide services. So we have to make sure that we're constantly repeating and constantly redirecting so that they have that real rounded information and then they, therefore they can make more empowered decisions there moving forward. Absolutely, thank you, Vanessa. Next slide, please. 
currently are there are 691 condemned inmates in the state of California. Out of those cases, our advocates monitor about 430 and providing next of kin and survivors of those violent crimes with the status of the automatic appeal in the county, state, and federal courts. We also do research around new laws introduced and working with our prosecutors to break down, again, as mentioned before, the legal terminology to explain to survivors that next of kin of the appeal. Additionally, some of these cases can last from 10 years to 20 years or more in the court. Uh, a booklet is provided and is available on online for download at our public website, which will be shared in the chat for more information. In regards to our um, non-capital punishment cases, uh, because we usually these tend to be those that after conviction, a defendant has 60 days from the date of the sentencing to file an, an appeal. Over 9,000 appeals are filed annually. Uh, we realize appeals are, because we realize appeals are handled annually, we make every effort to make sure we provide more information as to the need of understanding for these types of cases by making sure that we're continually doing outreach with local level uh, nonprofits, victim service providers, uh, and making sure that we're contacting our district attorney offices, victim service providers. Uh, the criminal justice process, unfortunately, does not just end at sentencing. Oftentimes, we also have to provide survivors and next of kin with emotional support because these hearings or these types of support or even getting a call from our office can be very intimidating. And so oftentimes it can be very triggering again. Um, so that's why we try to provide information as soon as we can. It's very imperative that our local agencies, our local nonprofits, our local district attorney offices uh, understand that we exist and the appeal process, or there's more to the criminal justice process than just the prosecuting offices uh, convicting and then um, sealing a case. It's still, the defendant still has the ability to appeal and then we're therefore continuing the criminal justice process. Uh, as mentioned before, defendants have a right to appeal their conviction or waive it. But if they do move forward with appealing their original conviction, a victim or survivor of a violent crime has a right to know what is taking place at our office. Next slide, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Vanessa. So like Vanessa mentioned, the defendants do have the right to an appeal. Um, sometimes in our capital cases and our, even in non-capital cases, an appeal can be filed right at the time of sentencing. So sometimes attorneys have the appeal ready to go, or sometimes it can take up to 60 days for those appeals to happen. Um, reversals can and do happen in both cases. So when the reversals do occur, that particular case will be resent back to the local county for further proceedings, whether it be for a retrial, for a resentence, or for the entire sentence to be vacated in general. And so they are common in both capital and non-capital cases. As you can see on the screen in the capital cases, we see a lot of the defendants saying they didn't have effective trial at the court or there was some kind of jury misconduct. In our non-capital cases, we do see a lot of these bills. It's important for us to be in contact with these victims only because we understand that at the time of sentencing, victims are promised or told that a particular defendant is going to be sentenced to X amount of months in prison or X amount of months in jail or whatever it is. But then when these bills are laws are passed, that could change at any moment. And it's important for us to be in contact with those victims so they can know, hey, we understand that, you know, at the time of sentencing, the defendant was sentenced to X amount of time in state prison. However, this particular law has passed and there may be a possibility that that sentence may be reduced or vacated. And it can be a very re-triggering and traumatizing moment for that victim. And that is where we come in as victim advocates to provide that support and, and to break that terminology down, to break what that law means and to get that victim connected to um, the attorney that was prosecuting the case so that can better understand how that is going to affect um, the appeal or defendant's sentence. Next slide, please. So with that being said, after sentencing at the local level, um, there is a form that's be, that usually is filed that's on the right-hand side. It's for the Office of the Victim and Survivors' Rights Services for a victim to request victim services at the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. It's called a 1707 form. And so that particular form is usually filled out with the victim advocate and the victim at the local level. And that form is sent to, again, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. 
However, it is also important to know that the form on the left-hand side is Request for Criminal Appeal Notification. So that form should be filled out by the victim and victim advocate, and that is a form for them to be notified if a defendant will file an appeal on their, on their case. And that form is sent directly to our office here at the Office of the Attorney General. Whether or not the defendant files an appeal or not, we will still reach out to that particular victim and let them know either the defendant file an appeal and we're going to track the case and keep them notified of any court proceedings or 60 days has passed and the defendant has not filed an appeal at all and whatever sentence they were given at the time at the local level is still going to stand. So as you can see on the screen, there is a QR code for you to scan it on your phone. It can be brought up or you can find the link at the bottom to um, download that form, but we will be putting these links at the end of the presentation for you to have as well. Next slide. Then we have our safety, which is a sexual assault forensic evidence tracking kit, but we want to also talk about um, AB 1312 or Assembly Bill 1312. It was a bill that was developed to provide additional victim rights to survivors of sexual abuse. Um, oftentimes we, we try and make sure that we're at each presentation we're talking about this because it's not often known. Um, we also hate for victims and survivors to do their own research and find our office. So again, a lot of our work is also surrounded uh, around providing research. This law also further mandates that all local law enforcement agencies develop a card that explains in clear language of the rights of sexual assault victims and makes this card accessible to each provider in its jurisdiction responsible for providing medical evidentiary or physical examinations arising out of a sexual assault. As a courtesy request, our unit did develop the following card that you see there on the screenshot, um, being screenshot. And, and this is to further assist law enforcement or to further support law enforcement and medical examiners with uh, providing them an example of this card and this is the card that should be provided during the initial contact of a survivor of sexual abuse. Some of these rights include, as you can see, um, you have a right to get answers. Was your evidence analyzed within 18 months? You can have a 24-hour confidential sexual assault counselor, victim advocate, or other support persons with you during an exam or an interview. You get to decide. It's your choice to get a physical exam, be a part of the criminal case, report the assault. Oftentimes, again, these are very sensitive, very traumatic experiences that someone may go through, and we want to make sure that this information is provided so that they can take this home and maybe later down the road read, read up on this because, again, they're, they're being bombarded with individuals who are coming to see them, to asking them questions, and so we want to make sure that victims are walking away with at least some form of information hand in hand with their Marcy's rights and their Survivor Bill of Rights, and then also to include some of these national domestic violence hotlines, national human trafficking hotlines, um, and to include our phone number on there to have access to more information as to where their, their rape kit lies. Um, with respect to AB 1312, our unit, along with local law enforcement, have the ability to provide survivors of sexual abuse who have undergone this forensic or medical examination to, to require us and law enforcement to be providing the victims with their status of their rape kit or sexual assault medical examination. Oftentimes, um, what we get on, on our end is some of the tracking features include receiving statuses that include kit received by law enforcement, DNA analysis has been completed. Starting in July 2022, survivors of sexual assault will have the ability to privately, securely, and confidentially access and track their own sexual assault evidence kit on, a D on our DOJ portal. Um, we still, however, wish and encourage for survivors to reach out to our unit to be provided with further resources and referrals to include warm handoffs and with local law enforcement agencies, district attorney victim advocates, and rape crisis centers in their area for trauma informed and wraparound services. Um, next slide here. How survivors can reach out to our office, we will put our toll free line phone number towards the end, um, but we wanna just give um, a picture of technically or how a survivor or how a victim will come in contact with our office. 
they will call the toll-free line number, they will leave his or her name and contact information on a recorded line, they will receive a call back from a victim services advocate within 48 hours, um, oftentimes it's even less than that. We will, as long as they're able to provide a kit number or law enforcement agency report number, is all we'll need to make sure that we're doing our own research on our end and making sure that we have that, that kit status available upon them reaching out to us. Um, as mentioned several times, when victims contact our public toll-free line, we don't just provide information or status. Some of these calls, because they are, they are sensitive, we we go above and beyond with providing crisis intervention over the phone, emotional support over the phone, before we can actually even get to the basis of the questions in regards to how, what happens in the criminal justice process. I'm proud to state that um, anytime a survivor um, contacts our office or our line, they speak to a victim advocate. They will be speaking to someone who is knowledgeable and holds years of experience in victim services and also handling these types of sensitive cases. Uh, again, due to the nature and sensitivity of these calls, for the most part, survivors, a majority of them are coming to us to make sure that they are understanding the information, they have clarifying questions, and then therefore we can be able to assess the caller and provide them with appropriate resources and referrals so that we're not further triggering them and causing further harm than good. Next slide, please. Thank you, Vanessa. So we are, I'm going to talk about Assembly Bill 1506, um, which is Officer Involved Shooting Investigations. So with the implementation of AB 1506, which was last year in regards to the investigations of officer involved shootings, um, VSU is a part of the officer, the office, officer involved shootings that the AG's office is investigating. So what our role is, is we are to make contact within 48 hours with the decedent's next of kin. So what that looks like is that we will be the point of contact with the decedent's next of kin and our deputy attorney general. So we do provide them with community resources, information. We do warm handoffs. What that basically means is that we are contacting the the local agencies in their area to see what services are available for them. And we don't just give the victim the phone number and say, call these people. We do three-way calls. We say, hey, I have a victim on the phone with me. Here's kind of what the situation is. And I'm just going to connect the call. And if need be, we stay on the phone call with them to make sure that they are being treated with fairness and respect and that they are having that trauma-informed contact with that person. We do our, we are facilitators and attend meetings with the next of kin. Um, and our deputy attorney generals to provide status updates of the investigations, that orientation to the criminal justice system, what's going to happen next, um, what information, how long the investigation is going to take. Sometimes it takes quite a long time. The investigations is not a quick process. Um, we do um, want to protect the integrity of the investigation. So we do have to wear multiple hats, right? Because a lot of these cases are very highly sensitive, a lot of media attention surrounding these officer-involved shootings. So as soon as we know that there's information available, we do proceed with the guidance of our deputy attorney generals on what information can and cannot be released. Um, if things have, are very confidential when it comes to the investigation. So a lot of things that um, are in media, we wanna make sure that we let the next of kin know before a press release is released, before Anything was released to the media, we want to make sure that we notify those next of kin with the guidance of our deputy attorney generals. So it is kind of a moving part, lots of moving parts in these investigations, but we are family liaisons to these decedents next of kin, but we do provide resources and information along with that crisis innovation, that emotional support, those warm handoffs. So we do provide those services to the next of kin as well. Next slide. So we do provide resources and publications, like I mentioned before, not only to our local community agencies and victims, but also to the public as well. Our resources and publications do come in 23 different languages. So if you are a service provider and you're looking for a particular brochure, a particular card, um, in any particular language, you're more than welcome to reach out to us via email. And we're more than happy to send that out to you at no charge. And again, we'll put that information in the chat box so people can, um, can get that information from us. Next slide, please. 
With that being said, here is our statewide victim referral line, resource um, phone line, and our email address, victimservices at doj.ca.gov. And our toll-free line is 877-433-9069. Victim advocates Ashley Rojas, Brene Adami, Rose Robinson, Vanessa Ruiz, and our VSU manager, John Milan. You'll see our work email and our work cell phone. So if there's any questions that you do have regarding this presentation or a particular case that you have, you're more than welcome to reach out to us at our victim services email leave a message on our toll-free line, or you can reach out to us individually. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this presentation. We hope that it was informative to you. Uh, please do keep in contact with us. Rose and Vanessa did share their contact information. We have um, our team has their victim services, email address, phone number. You can also reach the Office of Care at care at doj.ca.gov. Laura has put that in the chat as well. She's part of our team. And we are looking forward to planning more of these that would be beneficial to you. Our next one we are looking at doing in late summer, so around um, early August, late July. So please keep a lookout for an email from us with the date, time, topic for the presentation, and we look forward to engaging with you further. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.